Howdy, I'm Kelly Patrick. I'm a vet student at Texas A&M University, and this is my presentation over animal behavior. Um, some of the things we're going to learn today are common animal behaviors, wild animal behaviors, unwanted animal behaviors and how to correct them, some training techniques, and researching behavior. So what is behavior? Um, give me your definition. The dictionary defines behavior as the manner of conducting oneself, anything that an organism does involving an action and response to stimulation, the response of an individual, group, or species to its environment, and the response of an individual or animal to past experiences and memories. So what are some common animal behaviors? We can have a happy animal, a sad animal, an anxious animal, a hungry animal, and an aggressive animal. These behaviors relate to human behaviors and that we all share the same, the same behaviors. So we can be happy, sad, anxious, hungry, or angry. What are some other types of behaviors? In the wild, animals either live in herds or live in solitary packs. Um, there's two reasons to live in a herd or a pack. One, protection from predators. And two, hunting packs offer a more efficient way of capturing prey. Why do some animals live solitary lives? Some animals live alone because there's not enough resources or prey in the area to support more than one animal. Some other types of behavior are prey versus predator behaviors. Some prey animals react differently than others to predator animals. For example, rabbits tend to freeze when they see a predator coming, whereas horses run in the opposite direction. Some other types of behaviors are predator animals can either live in solitary packs or live in large family packs. Um, and they live in packs not for protection, but just to make hunting easier. Some predators, such as lions, do live in family social packs, but for the most part, it's to make uh, hunting easier. Um, some differences between male and female animals are females tend to take care of the young. They take care of the area where the family lives. And some of them are even the hunters and gatherers for the family. Males tend to be viewed as the dominant uh, animal in the pack. And they tend to be the protectors. Where this is reversed is in horses, the mare or the female um, horse is usually the dominant animal and leads the pack. And when they get to a watering hole, she's the first one to drink. And she tends to be the protector. But for the most part, the females take care of the family and the males uh, protect the pack. So why do wild animals have these behaviors? Mostly for survival of the species. Um, without these, these behaviors, they wouldn't be able to hunt or protect each other well enough for the species to survive. So how did animals get these behaviors? There's three ways that these animals um, either inherited or learned these traits. The first way they inherited these traits is genotype. Um, these behaviors are part of the animal's genetic makeup and are due to the evolution of packs over time. Um, the second way is learned behaviors. This is the animal learns from a certain experience they've had and that shapes the way they act in the future. And the third way is present environment. Um, this is the animals must adapt to whatever environment they act, they're in at that certain time and just deal with what they have there. So that's the three ways the animals get the behaviors. So back to domestic animals. Why is it important to recognize behaviors in domestic animals? The most important reason is you have to be able to keep yourself safe, to understand when a dog is angry and when a dog is happy, when you should approach it, and when you should not. So, more detail in recognizing behaviors. So, a happy dog. Some ways you can see if a dog is happy is if they have a panting, relaxed expression, an excited tail wag, if they're doing a play bow, which is where they put their front feet on the ground and kind of lift their hind end in the air and just kind of wiggle at you, or tail thumping on the floor. Um, an anxious dog, or more of a scared dog, has one paw raised, 
They are licking their face or their paws a lot. They have a tucked tail. They're barking or whining. Um, if it's a dog with a curly tail, they'll drop their tail between their legs. Um, they might urinate or defecate, and they're only wagging the end of their tail. Now, anxiety in cats um, can show a lot of the same things, but mostly their tail will be swishing, they'll be growling, and they'll have dilated, big, wide eyes. So, aggression in dogs. Um, you'll see growling or snarling. Um, they'll be snapping at you. They might be aggressive barking. If, you have them on a, if the owner has them on a leash, they'll be lunging on the leash or trying to get at you. Um, or they'll be standing still with a wide base stance and a low head. Um, aggression in cats is much the same, but they'll be growling or hissing again, swishing their tail, maybe spitting at you, which is kind of a, a coughing noise while they're swatting at you. Um, and they'll be swiping at you with their claws. So you want to avoid any animal that's exhibiting any of those signs. So we're going to talk about some unwanted behaviors in your domestic animals. And the first is fear biting. So dogs and cats a lot of times don't bite because they, they're mad at you or because they're aggressive. They bite because they're scared of you. Um, but dogs can bite because they're you know, either scared or aggressive. So we're going to talk about who's most likely to get bit. And it's children under the age of 15, males and dog owners are most likely to be bit. And what type of dog is most likely to bite? Um, it's actually family pets more than stray animals. Just because we spend more time with family pets, so they're more likely to bite. Um, Scared dogs are more likely to bite than relaxed, happy dogs. Aggressive dogs, of course, are more likely to bite. Hungry dogs, um, if they've been fed in a while and you reach down to touch their food, uh, they're more likely to bite you. But the big thing to remember is any dog can bite. Um, you shouldn't assume just because the dog looks happy or, or you've known the dog that it won't bite you. Any dog can bite you. You just have to be careful when approaching them. So how to prevent a dog bite. So what you want to do is when you're in public, if it's your dog, you want to keep them on a leash. You want to make sure they're well socialized and used to being around other people and dogs. Um, you don't want to take your dogs into situations where they might feel uneasy or uncomfortable. You want to be cautious um, either with your dog around unfamiliar dogs or if you're just out, you want to be cautious around unfamiliar dogs. You want to always ask permission before you pet anyone's dog. Avoid direct eye contact and do not run or yell at the dog. Keep your arms down at your sides and don't hover over the dog. Just kind of keep your arms down and stand a little away until you get permission to pet it. Um, when around an unfamiliar animal, speak in a calm voice so you don't upset it. And just uh, once you've got permission to pet it, then go ahead. So some more unwanted behaviors. Urinating in the house. This can be caused by fear. Um, they can be submissive urinating. It can be separation anxiety. Um, maybe if you brought a new pet or a new baby home, the dog can be upset and be urinating in the house. They can be mar marking their territory, or it can be a lack of proper house training. So how to prevent this? First, you want to do good basic house training. Um, and this is done by making sure when your new puppy um, needs to go outside, that you take it outside and give it proper time to be out there to urinate. You want to go outside and make sure it goes potty. And when it does, you want to reward the appropriate behavior. So when it does urinate or defecate outside, you want to give it a treat, tell a good puppy, and make sure that they know that's the right thing to do. If your dog is submissive urinating in the house, like if you yell at it and it starts urinating in the house because it's scared, don't keep yelling at it. You want to stop yelling try to identify the action that caused it to do the urinating in the house and then avoid that, avoid that um, action in the future. So uh, excessive barking is another big problem with, uh, with dogs. So this can be because they're either alerting you or warning you to something coming into your yard. They can be attention seeking, they can be bored, they can be anxious, or they can just be lonely. So some ways to prevent this um, is you need to stay calm and don't shout no at the dog. That just, they think you're barking at them, so they'll just bark more. 
Um, you want to get their attention and tell them to either sit or lie down until they're relaxed and stop barking. Um, don't try to run up to your dog and hug them and comfort them when they're barking because then they'll just think you're playing with them and that'll just reinforce the barking. Um, if they're barking to get your attention, you need to ignore them until they stop. And if they're barking because they're bored, you need to give them more activities to do. Um, wherever they are in the house or the yard, you need to give them some balls to play with or stuff like that so they'll um, have more things to do with and won't bark as much. So jumping on people is another big um, unwanted behavior in dogs. So they do it because they're either attention seeking, because they're just really excited to see you, or because they're asserting their dominance, which is least likely, but sometimes they can do it. So how to prevent this is teach them from a young age that jumping is not acceptable. Even when they're a puppy, don't let them jump up on you because you think it's cute. They'll, they'll just think, oh, I can do that forever. Never cuddle or hug your dog when they jump up on you. That just reinforces the unwanted behavior. And when your dog jumps at you, when he's running at you, kind of turn your body sideways so he'll jump right past you. And then pretty soon he'll get the idea that it's not much fun to do that, so he'll stop. So how to train a dog. There's two ways to train an animal. Either classical conditioning, which is a conditioning Conditioning stimulus is applied and the unlearned behavior is then performed. Or operant conditioning, which is uses consequences to modify the occurrence of a learned behavior. So clicker training, this is a great way to, to train dogs. It's a form of operant conditioning. The clicker is much faster than saying good dog and it can be used with treats to reward a dog for good behavior. So how you do it, as you get a clicker and a handful of your dog's favorite treats. You then click the clicker several times and give them a treat after every click. Um, and then when the dog's not looking at you, click the, the clicker and if he looks at you, give him a treat because he realizes that he should look at you when you do this. Now when, you're, when your dog follows your command, like sit or stay or lie down, click it and give it a treat and then it'll learn to associate the click with a good behavior and pretty soon you can just click it and he'll know he did something right. Crate training. This is a big, a big deal with dogs. Um, you should always have your puppy crate trained um, for one of three reasons. One, to provide a safe way to transport them. It's much easier to put the dog's crate in the car um, and load them up and it's very safe that way. Um, also, when you're gone at school or work, your puppy needs to be in a crate in the house so he doesn't just destroy furniture or walls or stuff like that. Also, if there's an emergency and they need to be evacuated or boarded, they need to know how to be in a crate so they won't be as nervous or anxious about being in one. So how to? You need to select a crate that's large enough for the puppy to be able to stand up and turn around and lie down in. Um, you need to put the crate in a place where the dog spends a lot of time. And you need to encourage the puppy to go into the crate with either food or treats or feed him his dinner in there and then he'll associate it with the place he likes to be. Um, and gradually increase the time that you start leaving the puppy in the crate. Start with five or ten minutes and then you can work your way up. Don't just stick him in there and lock him in there for, you know, three hours at a time. You need to gradually work up um, how long he stays in there. So some other training tools. Um, there's many different kind of collars and there's a specific purpose for each. Um, and you should always talk to a trainer or someone who knows how to use them um, to know how to use them properly. So there's choke and pinch collars, which these are more of a, a noose type of collar that you slip around your dog's head and when they do, when they're pulling on them, they tighten and it's uncomfortable for them so they'll stop pulling. Or when they do an unwanted behavior, you can give it a very quick uh, jerk and then you release it just as quickly as you jerked it and it'll get their attention and it's uncomfortable so they realize they shouldn't do that kind of behavior. There's also shock collars which emit a low voltage um, shock to the dog and we'll talk about these a little later but not a lot of people use them anymore. Um, they come up with better ways to train the dogs. You can also use muzzles and these are more for either aggressive dogs who need to go out into public and this stops them from being able to bite people or just maybe a dog who's scared in a, in a different situation and they can use muzzles on those. 
There's also halters and head halters, like a gentle leader or a head and chest body halter. Um, these stop the dogs from pulling because when they pull on them, it either pulls, the, if it's a head halter, it'll pull their head to the side, or if it's a chest halter, they just um, can't pull against them as well. So these really help in leash training your animals. So researching behavior. There was a study done using citronella spray collars, which is a collar that the dogs wear around their necks, and when they bark, it sprays citronella in their face, and they don't like that smell, so it usually stops them from barking, and shock collars. So what they did was they got a group of dogs who were deemed to be excessive barkers, um, and the owners were given both a citronella spray collar and a shock collar to use for two weeks. They used one for two weeks and then used the other for two weeks. And then they were asked which ones they liked better. So which of the two methods of training do these collars use? Either classical conditioning or operant conditioning. And they use operant conditioning. Good job. So the results of the study were that most of the owners preferred the citronella spray collars. Um, half of the owners reported that the shock collar had no effect at all on their animals, and only one owner reported liking the shock collar better. So why is research important? Research is vital so that we can better understand how to train our pets and correct behavior in our pets. Unwanted animal behaviors is a big reason why, why animals get turned over to shelters, and if we can understand how to better train and correct conditions that we don't like, then we can have a much happier time with our pets. And also, some of the research done on animals helps um, you and me, helps humans, um, either medical or behavior. Um, it's just a big part of how we, we stay happy as humans. So what did we learn today? We learned about common animal behaviors, wild animal behaviors, unwanted animal behaviors and how to correct them. We talked about some training techniques and a little bit about researching behavior. This has been a presentation by Texas A&M University Vet School, and I hope you enjoyed it.